weekend. Hot Atlanta. So I uh, couldn't do the show live. I was there for the uh, sixth annual Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. Uh, I'm there each year, third weekend in July. So I was a presenter. And then also um, I was a vendor there. And while I was in Atlanta, I filmed my portion of uh, Black Friday Part 2, The African Global Legacy. Black Friday Part 2, The African Global Legacy is the Black Friday series of documentaries I'm in, just one of the documentaries I'm in. So there are three documentaries coming out this year that I'm in. Uh, I talked to Raheem Shabazz while I was there, director of Elementary Genocide. Uh, so Elementary Genocide Part 3 comes out August 22nd. Academic Holocaust that deals with the school to prison pipeline, so I'm in that documentary. Along with two of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, Professor James Small. Then we have uh, um, Black Friday Part 2 debuting October 3rd, 2017 in Atlanta. And it'll be available on DVD, etc. We'll do a screening here in Detroit coming up sometime soon. And then also uh, two or three months ago, the documentary from uh, Anthony Brogdon came out, uh, Business in the Black, Business in the Black, and I'm featured in that documentary as well. Okay, so look, uh, we have a lot to talk about tonight. Um, today is the 50th anniversary of the 1967 Detroit Rebellion, and I was at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History yesterday for the uh, panel discussion that um, a solid association for the study of African American life and history had, Jamon Jordan. Uh, was on the panel and he was uh, one of the moderators. So it was an excellent panel discussion dealing with uh, the rebellion, the aftermath of it, and what's going on right now with the takeover of Detroit, gentrification, uh, water being shut off, uh, theft, theft of the land, uh, all different types of things like that. Today I was back at the museum for the um, presentation from Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Gerald Horn, brilliant scholar, historian, author of, uh, I think, about 20 books. Um, the book he talked about today was The Counter-Revolution of 1776, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. Okay, so uh, get this book. Check out Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. See if Nandy can get it for you. 12511 Woodwood Avenue, Highland Park, Michigan. Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. See if she can get it for you. Uh, fantastic book. If you watch News One Now with Roland Martin, you've heard Roland talk about it before. And um, I've seen um, at least one interview uh, Roland has done with uh, Dr. Gerald Horn also. Okay, so um, on today's show, we'll talk, uh, in, in, in the second hour, we'll talk a little bit about the 1967 Rebellion, because coming up this Thursday on Wake Up With Steve Hood, we're doing two hours on that, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. My guest will be historian and educator Jamon Jordan. Uh, you heard me on Charlene Mitchell's show uh, a few weeks ago. We talked about the uh, history of uh, some of the uh, names of streets in Detroit that are named after slave masters, like Livernois and DeQuinder and Macomb and Kaz. These were all slave owners here in the city of Detroit. Well, he's going to be our special guest on Wake Up With Steve Hood this Thursday, July 27th, 7 a.m. to uh, 9 a.m., and uh, we'll deal with the Detroit Rebellion. So on today's show, we'll talk about Colin Kaepernick gets advice from Michael Vick to help him get picked up uh, by another NFL team. Michael, who let the dogs out, Vick? Very interesting conversation there. And then uh, the Tuskegee experiment is back in the news. The Tuskegee experiment is back in the news. So if you heard me this past Thursday, on uh, Wake Up With Steve Hood, the morning show here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Listen, Monday through Friday, uh, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and I'm on every Thursday, uh, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Wake Up With Steve Hood. We talked about the Tuskegee experiment while it's back in the news. So we'll deal with the Tuskegee experiment uh, today, and we'll dispel some myths about it. And this experiment was supposed to last originally six to nine months and ended up lasting 40 years. Ended up lasting 40 years. And now um, descendants of uh, those men who were involved in the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment are asking a judge to give them, not a museum, the remaining settlement funds. And there was a lawsuit filed in 1973. 
It was settled in 1974 for about $10 million. Okay, we're going to get deep into this and t into the Tuskegee experiment and deal with a lot of things you probably didn't know about it. One, one of the first things that most people think is that they injected the man with syphilis. That's not true. They already had syphilis. They did not inject them with syphilis. That's just one of those myths. All right. Um, next, we'll, we'll talk about Donald Trump's uh, fr um, um, voter in, uh voter integrity uh, panel, his voter fraud panel. Uh, this past week it held his first public meeting. They talked about it on AM Joy, MSNBC, Joy and Reed. We'll talk about that. And then uh, Paul Butler, you've heard some clips I've played before from like News One Now or MSNBC of Paul Butler. He's a former uh, federal prosecutor and he is a law professor at uh, Georgetown University. He has a new book out called Chokehold, Chokehold, and he examines the criminal justice system, race, and the policing of black men. The criminal justice system, race, and the policing of black men. We'll talk about that also. All right, so on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Also go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can sign up for our email newsletter there at um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. All right. And remember, on Fridays, I do my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they did teach you in school. This is a 12-hour, six-week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with thousands, thousands of years of history leading up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade. And we deal with current, we deal with events that led up to it taking place so we can better understand it. We deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. We deal with the fact that African people were in this country. We call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. You have the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA DNA on the planet, the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. So we deal with all that and a lot more. Okay, Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for that class. And all the sessions are, are, are recorded. Um, so as soon as you register, you can watch the first four sessions, and we have about 12 hours of bonus content also, okay? All right. Um, so this past week, um, Michael Vick was back in the news, and so was Colin Kaepernick. Uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Colin Kaepernick, and we talked about Colin Kaepernick going to Ghana, okay? He traced his ancestry, his DNA ancestry, back to Ghana. We know that he is... Um, biracial. Um, he was raised uh, by an adoptive uh, white family, okay, and his mother is, his birth mother is white, okay, when we talk about Colin Kaepernick. All right, so we know that um, he was in Ghana the uh, 4th of July week, right, and he posted on Instagram and he asked uh, African Americans, how can we truly celebrate independence on the day that robbed our ancestors of theirs, okay? So he talked about that. A lot of people, some people agreed with them. Other people said, oh, it's controversial, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't know what the controversy is if you study history. If you read Dr. Gerald Horn's book, The Counter, -Rev the Counter Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America, is crystal clear, okay? The U.S. was robbing African people of their... Uh, freedom at the same time they were fighting against Great Britain for their for their freedom okay so this uh, I don't see what the problem is but Michael Vick um, had some advice for Colin Kaepernick which is very interesting so Michael Vick was on uh, Fox Sports One's Speak for Yourself okay uh, this past Monday okay which was the 17th okay uh, July 17th and 
Um, he was interviewed by uh, Jason Whitlock also. So we know Colin Kaepernick used to be used to play for the San Francisco 49ers. He's a free agent now. He led the uh, protest against the national anthem, protesting against white supremacy and racism and police misconduct, uh, the unjust killing of um, African Americans, especially unarmed African Americans, etc. Right. So this led to a, a lot of backlash. He got death threats, etc. Uh, from this. So Michael Vick had some advice for him. And Michael Vick said, the first thing we got to get Colin to do is cut his hair. The first thing we got to get Colin to do is cut his hair. Uh, he said, listen, I'm not up here to be politically correct, but even if he puts cornrows in it, I don't think he should, uh, I don't think he should represent himself in that way in terms of just a hairstyle. Just go clean cut. Why not? You're already dealing with a lot of controversy surrounding this issue. What he needs to do is try to be presentable, okay? Well, Colin, Colin Kaepernick wears his hair in an afro, okay? Now, I don't know if Michael Vick thought about this, but uh, most of the black players in the 1970s and early 80s wore the same hairstyle. They wore an afro, okay? So, uh, did, would he tell them to be clean cut? Think about this. Michael Vick, who oftentimes wore uh, uh, cornrows, and who went to prison for dog fighting and killing dogs, all right? Michael, who let the dogs out, Vic. He's giving uh, respectability advice to Colin Kaepernick. I just find that very interesting. Now, the reason why Colin Kaepernick is not being picked up by another NFL team is not because of his hair, okay? I mean, just, <laughs> I mean, let's just be real. It's not because of his hair. And if you read the article from the Bleacher Report, right, uh, from August 31st, 2016, because I have about 60 articles on Colin Kaepernick in this stance. I actually did a lecture dealing with Colin Kaepernick uh, September 2016. It was called The Time We Have Been Waiting For Is Now. The Time We Have Been Waiting For Is Now. Colin Kaepernick, um, the, uh, the, the National Anthem, the Black Bank Movement, and Too Many Slave Movies. The Time We Have Been Waiting For Is Now. Okay, we have it available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So, um, if you look at the article from the Bleacher Report, right, B-L-E-A-C-H-E-R, uh, August 31st, 2016, it's called Mike Freeman's 10-point stance. Mike Freeman's 10-point stance. Kaepernick anger intense in NFL front offices. And what this article talks about is uh, Mike Freeman interviewed seven executives uh, at, at, at the uh, for NFL teams? Okay, he, he interviewed executives at seven NFL teams. Right? He didn't disclose their names, but he posted the comments that they said about Colin Kaepernick. They called him a traitor. They talked about how they hated this guy. One of them said, "I don't want him anywhere near my team." One front office executive said, "He's a traitor." Um, it, Mike says, it goes on to say, he wasn't alone in the anger directed towards Kaepernick in interviews with seven team executives. In interviews with seven team executives, each said he did not want Kaepernick on his team. Now, this is back August 31st, 2016, when Kaepernick is still playing with the uh, San Francisco 49ers, right? And this is just a few days after he comes out and talks about um what his uh, protest was about, okay? So Steve Weish, uh, who writes for um, NFL.com, Steve Weish saw that he was on the, um, on the bench during the national anthem, okay? And he asked him about it. So if you go back to one of the very first articles on this whole uh, controversy, that was from August 27, 2016. Uh, Colin Kaepernick explains why he sat during the national anthem. This is from NFL.com, written by Steve Weiss. Steve Weiss was basically the guy who broke this story. Okay, This is during the preseason. The August 26 uh, preseason game was on a Friday. They played against the Green Bay Packers at Levi Stadium. Okay, uh, This was the second game of the preseason. The first game of the preseason, Kaepernick did the same thing, but people really didn't pick up on it. So Kaepernick was asked about this, and Kaepernick said at the, at the post-game uh, press conference, 
He said, quote, I'm not going to stand up here to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. Okay, so these were his initial statements. All right, so then he uh, uh, gave more information uh, to, 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 to further explain what he was talking about. And he said that uh, this is not something that I'm going to uh, run by anybody. I'm not going to look for approval. I have to stand up for people that are, that are oppressed. If they take football away, my endorsements from me, I know that I stood up for what is right. Okay, now Kaepernick said that he has thought he had thought about going public with his feelings earlier, but he said, "quote I felt that I needed to understand the situation better." Okay, and he also uh, in the article from Steve White, he goes on to say he said that he has discussed his feelings with his family, and after months of witnessing some of the civil unrest in the U.S., he decided to be more active and involved in rights for Black people. Uh, 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 okay, so. So you can check out this article, get more context uh, to it. This is from NFL.com. Colin Kaepernick explains why he sat during National Anthem. This is from August 27, 2016, the day after that second preseason game where he sat on the bench once again, okay? All right, so you have uh, the heads of front offices who hate him. They say they don't want him on his team. And really what they're afraid of is that um, his consciousness consciousness will wake up some of the other players on the team and they'll have a real revolt, okay? This is really what they're afraid of, okay? Another uh, uh, NFL front office executive said he has no respect for our country, okay? He said, F that guy, okay? Another said that if an owner asked him to sign Colin Kaepernick, he would consider resigning rather than do it, okay? So there's a lot of venom. And, and keep in mind, most of these, most of the owners of these sports teams, uh, most of the owners of these NFL teams are, are white male billionaires. A lot of them white supremacists. Let's just be honest. And you see them in the baseball, basketball, also. Right? We, we we know that. You know, one of them, one of them donated seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to Donald Trump's uh, presidential campaign. Imagine that. He held a private, he held a private uh, fundraiser for him, also. Okay, I'm not gonna call any names. He owns the Cleveland Cavaliers. I ain't gonna call any names. We don't want to put them on the spot, or do we? Uh, but but so let's. I mean, let's just be real with this, right? So, so Michael Vick is giving advice to Colin Kaepernick on. Uh, he's giving him uh, uh, grooming advice and saying, "Hey, if he cuts his hair, okay, he have a better chance of getting picked up." No, it's not his hair. Uh, that, that that that's not the reason why uh, 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 NFL teams don't want him. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the stance he took against uh, white supremacy by protesting against the national anthem. Okay, so Michael Vick went on to say, well, co-host Jason Whitlock, who's been in the news lately because of idiotic statements he's made, Jason Whitlock said, um, you were the guy who wore the cornrows, wore the gold chains, played the whole hip-hop image, okay? Um, he said, and, and Michael Vick responded, and said, I had an afro at times. Even during the tough times, it was something that people would whisper in my ear, uh, this is the way you're being perceived. Okay, he said, I, I, I understand, Colin. Uh, he's a great kid. Uh, he's a great kid, and the reason he's not playing has nothing to do with the national anthem. What universe does uh, Michael Vick live in? No, that's why he's not playing. It's because of his stance against the national anthem. It's not because of his hair, okay? And keep in mind, uh, Vic got picked up by another team. After he went to prison, uh, <laughs> Colin Kaepernick didn't kill anybody. He didn't kill any animals. He hasn't been to prison. He took a stand against white supremacy. I mean, look, look at what happened. He took a stand against white supremacy, okay? All right, now also it's important to note that um, Colin Kaepernick, when we talked about Kaepernick a couple weeks ago, when we talked about Kaepernick going to Ghana, his fiance went with him, DJ Nisa Diab from Hot 97. Um, she's a, 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 a radio DJ. Uh, and when you read articles about this, it's really believed she was the one behind uh, 
Colin Kaepernick developing developing a social consciousness and uh, coming out to really take a stand. Okay. All right. So Michael Vick goes on to say. Uh, okay, he's a great kid, and the reason he's not playing has nothing to do with the national anthem. I think it's more solely on his play, but yeah, everything takes precedent in terms of image perception. You got to clean it up. You got to make sure you do it all right, okay, quote unquote. All right, so Michael Vick said it was a difficult process for him to clean up, but it was one he had to accept in order to be presentable to the public and to the judge. Keep in mind, uh, Ka Colin Kaepernick doesn't have to go before a judge. He didn't break any laws. He didn't kill any animals. He didn't go to prison, okay? He just took a stand against white supremacy. Also, it's important to note, Kaepernick said he's not against the military, okay? He said he's not against the military. He's not against the soldiers, anything like this, all right? And if I remember correctly, I, uh, I've read numerous articles about this. I think he also said he's not against, in general, not against the police also, if I remember correctly. He's against police misconduct, all right? And he, and he, as time went on, he explained more about it because people were asking so many questions. Okay, so after facing backlash on social media for his anti-black comments, Okay, Michael, uh, quote unquote, anti black comments. Michael Vick shared a statement on Twitter on Tuesday. So the interview was on Monday. Okay, on Tuesday, Michael Vick shared this on Twitter. He said, Colin Kaepernick's hair has nothing to do with him not being on an NFL roster right, right now. Let's be clear. I wish only the best for Colin. I stand by what I said about him being, uh, I stand by. Uh, what I've said uh, about him being signed at some point this season to uh, help a NFL club. I think he is a great kid who has a bright future, and I'm looking forward to seeing him on the field again. Trust and believe what I said was not in malice, okay? Well, first of all, Colin is a grown man. He's not a kid. I think he's like 32 years old. He's a grown man, all right? Um, Colin Kaepernick responded to... Michael Vick's uh, statements with the definition of the Stockholm Syndrome, okay? He responded on social media, all right? So Kaepernick, who, <laughs> who began rocking his afro after initiating his national anthem protest, protest tweeted the definition of the Stockholm Syndrome Tuesday morning, okay? Uh, a move that is being read as a response to Michael Vick, all right? I think, I, I think he tweeted this before Michael Vick's um, response on social media. Okay, so here's what Colin Kaepernick said um, the, with the Stockholm Syndrome, okay? Uh, the Stockholm Syndrome appears when an abused victim develops a kind of respect and empathy towards their abuser. The Stockholm Syndrome appears when an abused victim develops a kind of respect and empathy towards their abuser. It was named after a bank robbery in Stockholm when a group of bank employees were held hostage and developed a strong sense of empathy towards their captors. When this traumatic event was over, they even defended their captors but not wanting, uh, uh, by not wanting to say anything that might endanger their captors' freedom. This usually happens because the victim sees the smallest act of decent behavior as an extracted event which makes them see their captors as essentially good. The victim sees the smallest act of decent behavior as an extracted event which makes them see their captors as essentially good. This way, they leave aside all the negative behavioral distinctions of their captors and focus on the positive ones. This syndrome is also called traumatic bonding or victim brainwashing. Traumatic bonding or victim brainwashing, okay? So Colin Kaepernick did a history clinic breaking down the Stockholm Syndrome, all right? So in this article here from uh, Huffington Post Black Voices by Taryn Finley, Taryn Finley, um, Name of the article, Michael Vick had the nerve to say uh, Colin Kaepernick should cut his hair. Michael Vick had the nerve to say Colin Kaepernick should cut his hair. This is from uh, July 18th, Monday, July 18th, 2017. 
uh, the article goes on to say, by defending the same racist attitudes that he, Michael Vick, faced during his 2008 trial for dogfighting, and well after he served 23 months in prison for the crime, Michael Vick reinforces the idea that professionalism and respectability is aligned with whiteness. Michael Vick reinforces the idea that professionalism and respectability is aligned with whiteness. For years after being locked up, Michael Vick had to jump through hoops on his road to redemption, like black men in this country often do. As recently as December 2016, while, while, while Michael Vick, uh, fresh haircut and all, was playing for the Atlanta Fal Falcons, more than 35,000 fans petitioned for him to be excluded from the team's season finale. While the petitions page cited his dogfighting conviction as the reason, it's Vic's blackness that ultimately made him irredeemable to white America. Because you got players who beat their wives who get back on teams and they don't have petitions against them. Okay, Michael Vick served his time, but once again, you know, he, he, I think he's a little, little confused. I think he needs to talk to uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick a little bit, okay? So Michael Vick's advice to Kaepernick validates the oppressive mainstream view of whose appearance is acceptable, white people's, and whose is not African Americans. Respect respectability politics won't save us also, okay? So um, check out that article from Huffington Post, Black Voices. Michael Vick had the nerve to say Colin Kaepernick should cut his hair. We'll go to the phone lines after the break. Uh, you listen to the uh, the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Voice of Detroit. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. When you think of the Voices right. of Detroit, there's only one the station that comes to mind. Just 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Can you turn that down in here, please? Yeah. We're the okay. Voice of Reason. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes, guys. Right. Stand by. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. The call the numbers 313-209-9000. 313-209-9000 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, we were just talking about before the break uh, Michael Vick's advice to uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, about cutting his hair so he looks uh, more respectable and presentable. Um, and after this segment, we're going to talk about the Tuskegee experiment, uh, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in Negro males. The Tuskegee experiment is back in the news also. Okay, so um, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Logan on line one. Hey, Logan, welcome to the African History Network show. How you doing? Hey, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? Hey, I'm all right, man. What's going on? Ain't nothing too much. I'm just looking at your show. I did say, listen, man, I'm too, you know, about one. Okay. But I got a question. My question is, you know, I understand the history, and I understand identifying, and I understand that. But I'd like to know what we're going to move on. And as far as the uh, league, uh, ownership of teams, let, let's pull our resources and own our own teams. Let's, let's own our own basketball teams. You said move on. Well, hold on, let me get, let me address your first comment. You said when we're gonna move on, move on. What do you mean move on? I mean I've been hearing this Michael Vick comment stuff on the news for almost a week now, brother. Well, I wasn't on last week, so this is the first time I've had a chance to talk about it. Yeah, but I've been talked about repeatedly. So my thing is more importantly, how can we pull our resources? And not not slight the show, not saying that disrespectful. I'm just saying you have a powerful voice. Right. Okay. Thank you. You identify the problem. Okay. What's up with the solution? Well, if you want to talk about economic empowerment, I mean, I'm in documentaries that deal with this. Uh, we can pull our resources now. We, when you want to talk about uh, NFL teams, keep in mind to own an NFL team, you have to be approved by, I think it's two thirds of the current owners that are basically all white, yeah. if not all white. So if you want to talk about owning a team, then you want to get together some uh, uh, millionaires. And uh, possibly a couple, you got about, I think, five African American billionaires Robert F. Smith, Oprah, uh, Jay Z is almost there. You want to get some of them together to uh, own a team, okay? If, if, if that's what you if that's what you're going if that's what you want to do, but that 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 that'll benefit largely them and the players who are on the team. Uh, if you want to deal with uh, economic empowerment in general, I, I mean, I deal with that on a regular basis also. Okay, well, I'd like to hear more about that, and uh, I'd like to deal with, you know, us. 
on a local level, unifying to create an opportunity for, you know, our you know, community, you know, just local community, entrepreneurship, you know, support mechanisms, and even you know, for our kids, introducing them early into entrepreneurship and different things of that nature to edify the community. So, uh, yeah, all the billionaires that you named, especially the black ones, come from humble beginnings. So uh, it's an example or a testimony to, you know, you and wherever you're sitting, you also can become a billionaire. So those are just the things I like to talk about. History, I love it. I'm from Alabama, Millbrook, Alabama. Right. It's uh, about 10 miles outside of Montgomery, Alabama. Right. So I'm very, you know, impressed and, and up to date with the Tuskegee. Uh, situation uh, and it, it's a misfortune, and we just want to make sure it's not uh, able to happen again. That's all. I'm okay, thanks for calling. Let's go to JR Line 2. Hey, JR, welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, tell us where you're calling from. Okay, I'm calling from uh, West Side Detroit. West Side Detroit, okay. Yes, sir. Appreciate the information. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, Colin Kaepernick is one in the line of a lot of great athletes that have uh, went before him and uh, was castigated in the same way. You know, let's go back to Jack Johnson, mm -hmm. the great Paul Robeson, and, and, you know, moving forward to, of course, Muhammad Ali, uh, Kurt Flood. Right. And I want to talk about the two contemporary athletes in recent times that were really ran out the uh, National Basketball Association. One was Craig Hodges that played for the Chicago Bulls. Okay. We talked about e economic empowerment in Chicago. And Stefan Marbury, who was personally trying to change the whole narrative around uh, the purchasing of these exorbitant cost of these gym shoes. And right. He tried to start his own line of gym shoes. He was basically ran out the league, he ended up having to go over to China to play basketball. Mm. So the the whole ideal of trying to work within that system of uh, corporate NFL, NBA, things of that nature. And you, and you saw that when Bill Cosby and another group of uh, millionaires tried to purchase NBC. So he's still working within the realm of that white supremacist attitude. And as you mentioned, they had to get approval of certain uh, owners to, to join their club or whatever. One thing that we can do as far as economic empowerment, you know, there's one that's followed sports since the 50s. Right. Uh, we as blacks can support Colin Kaepernick, but not support the NFL. Absolutely. Going to the games and buying the paraphernalia and all those types of things. And putting pressure on the sponsors that, that, that sponsor the NFL games. So that, you know, Right. Something we can do. You yeah. Know, I definitely look at, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, I look at Colin Kaepernick as just in a lot of great freedom fighters that understands his position in in this system, you know, and understanding that he, he was elevated on the on the shoulders of people that came before him. Right. You know, and I, uh, I, uh, you know, I wholeheartedly support him all the way, you know, all his endeavors. So I what? just wanted to... All right, and you and you have uh, I've seen at least one petition circulating uh, for African Americans to boycott the uh, NFL, boycott the games. I, I I've said that already that we need to do that. Uh, stop watching the games. Stop buying the paraphernalia uh, until until Colin Kaepernick is on the team. Okay, uh, stop buying the stop watching the games. Stop buying the paraphernalia. Um, uh, uh, tweet. Uh, uh, put on social media that you're boycotting the uh, uh, NFL games also. I don't watch them anyway because, I mean, why would I sit up and watch the Lions lose? That's a waste of time. I don't even watch the NFL. But, um, uh, and then also uh, also put pressure on the advertisers as well, which is extremely important, okay, which is another form of economic withdrawal going after the advertisers also. Okay, all right, thanks for calling, uh, JR. Thanks for calling. Uh, and if you look at... Bill O'Reilly and why Bill O'Reilly is not on Fox News uh, on the Fox News network anymore is not because Fox News had uh, uh, an epiphany and all of a sudden got some morals is not because 
uh, the advertisers all of a sudden got some morals. No, it's because organizations like ColorChange.org uh, got petitions. Uh, they got uh, um, uh, three, about 350,000 uh, signatures on the online petition, and they put tremendous pressure on advertisers to withdraw economic support from the Bill O'Reilly show, the O'Reilly Factor on Fox News, okay, to withdraw their advertising dollars. And you have almost 80 advertisers to do this. The show wasn't profitable anymore, and Fox News fired uh, Bill O'Reilly, okay? So this is another form of economic withdrawal. Uh, StudyColorChange.org, Huffington Post, Black Voices, had a really good article about this. We talked about it before here. Uh, and it talked about uh, uh, the black organization that uh, uh, forced Bill O'Reilly. Let me see. Here's the name of the article. This black org helped oust um, Bill O'Reilly by hitting Fox where it hurts. This black org, O-R-G, helped oust Bill O'Reilly by hitting Fox where it hurts. Okay. Money talks, bigots walk. And this is about colorchange.org who was also at the forefront of getting the TV show Cops off the air which was on the air on, on Fox for 25 years also instrumental in getting um, uh, Glenn what was, was his name uh, Glenn Beck Glenn Beck off the air as well okay read this article because this deals with uh, economic withdrawal strategies okay and remember Dr. King April 3rd 1968 he said that we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. We have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Okay, let's go to line three. Let's go to Tracy. Hey, Tracy, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. I'm calling from the east side of Detroit. Good okay. Evening, Michael. Hey, um, how you doing? The previous, good. The previous caller... Um, kind of answer my question about what previous athletes have been blackballed for political reasons. Mm -hmm. But I did want to bring up, I know you read the book, the what, $40 million slaves, the rise. Yeah, of William Roden. You know, the black, right. Yeah, William Roden, yeah. Chapter yep. 7, right, Chapter 7 talks about the conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. So even though I totally agree with you about the economic boycott, he was saying in the book that they start conditioning black boys early. Mm -hmm. you know, they do. Like eighth grade, tell me, you know, AAU to be apolitical. So right. when we get mad at Michael Jordan, but he had been conditioned early to be apolitical. Which is why we have to this which is why we have to get to them before white supremacy does. This is why we have to right. get to them when they're children and really start educating them. Education starts in the womb. Education starts in the womb because we were reading to my daughter, who's now five months old, we were reading to her in the womb. When you actually study this, education starts in the womb, and you have to uh, teach them their history when they're children before they start showing talent. Because when they start showing talent, that's when the vultures come after them. Okay, so you, so you, so you, the, so we're trying to, ed oftentimes trying to educate them too late after they've been primed and the vultures come after them and they're taught to be apolitical because then when they go to high school, when they go to college, okay, then uh, it, it, the, the, the priming escalates, okay, right. and they're taught to stay out of controversy, et cetera. You may lose your scholarship, things like this. Exactly. Yeah, so, so this is why we have to get to them much earlier. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, thanks for calling. Okay, let's go to Ken, uh, line four. Hey, Ken, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. Calling from Ypsilanti. My comment uh, on Colin Kaepernick is, and I think what Michael Vick is trying to tell him, that football is a marketing uh, business, mm -hmm. and uh, he's leaving a lot of money on the table. Uh, his uh, efforts could be better spent by uh, toning down his rhetoric Late, uh, he's leaving excess of $12 million on the table, which could really help uh, the causes that he's uh, interested in. You know, this kid, I think, is very confused. Uh, he lives around the corner from my uncle in Modesto, California. He was raised by a white family. 
Right. He was a, his adoptive white family. Yeah, he doesn't. I don't think he really understands what he's doing. And it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, I'm a vet, and uh, I had relatives that were killed in the war and represent this country, and do some of the things he did were just uh, outstanding for the national anthem and things like that. Mm-hmm. He actually created a firestorm. And when you're in a position that he's in and you're asking the public to support you and your team, and when you go out and you have to, that he had, it's just, it's just crazy. Well, he didn't create the firestorm. He didn't. Let, let's be clear on this. He he said no. no well, hold just a second, just a second. He 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 was clear. He said he's not against the soldiers. He said he's not against the military. He explained specifically why he was taking the stance against the national anthem. And if you study the national anthem, it's a white supremacist song. Let's be very clear about this. That was written by Francis Scott Key, who was a who was a slave owner who came from a slave owning family who felt that African people were inferior and he and originally started it was originally called the defense of Fort McHenry written September 13 1814 after during the war of 1812 after witnessing the attack on Fort McHenry okay so when you study Francis Scott Key and you study the actual song in the War of 1812, and then at the end of the War of 1812, you had about 6,000 African Americans who, who were enslaved by this country who went to the British side to fight against the U.S., and the, and the U.S. had the nerve to demand that the British return that one of race slaves back to them, and the British said no. So we, when, we, when we deal with this, we have to put this in context and be very clear. Colin Kaepernick said repeatedly, he's not against the military, He's not against the soldiers, okay? He's not against their sacrifice or anything like this. He was against police, the police misconduct, the oppression coming from white supremacy, and the police unjustly killing unarmed African Americans and people of color. This is why he took a stance against the national anthem, okay? Now, you know, the, those, who, those who lost their lives in the war, things like this, we're not against them, okay? We're not against them. But we have to be very clear, and he was, he was clear on why he did this. He did not create the storm. The storm was already existed before him. The storm already existed before him. He, because of his celebrity, he was able to shine a greater spotlight on it. Well, now, who is he going to benefit with losing all of his money and not be able to pursue his profession? Because no team in the league will accept him even if he plays for the minimum. Well, number one, he can play out of the country. Number two, it hasn't stopped his activism. Uh, we know that he uh, was part of a, a group that donated sixty thousand uh, dollars to Somalia to help uh, feed those in Somalia. We know he donated suits to those who were um, trying to get back on their feet and to find jobs. Uh, 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 after uh, men trying to find jobs, so he donated a lot of suits so that they can have a suit to uh, go out and look for jobs. We we know he donate. We know he also held a Know Your Rights uh, uh, campaign, a Know Your Rights camp, okay, in Oakland, California, back in October last year, to teach African American Hispanic children uh, their rights when it comes to law. Also dealing with uh, going to college. A number. He's doing. He's been doing a number of different things. So it hasn't stopped. Now what he has stopped. Well, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just a second. Hold on just a second. What he has done is he stopped um, his uh, stance against the national anthem. His stance against the national anthem has ended, but his activism has has not ended. Okay, but he said before, and if you read the uh, original article, August twenty seventh, August twenty seventh, two thousand sixteen, from uh, NFL dot com, um, written by Steve Weiss, he said if it costs him cost him his endorsements, if he calls them, they take away his NFL career, okay, you know, basically so be it, all right? So um, what he's saying is he is not going to tap dance for white supremacy, okay? All right, thanks for your call, Ken. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, we have another call. We have uh, Washington. Okay, hey, Washington, uh, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from. I'm calling from the west side of Detroit. How are you? All right, all right, Washington. Go ahead with your question and comment. Okay, listen. If you really want to get the attention of the NFL, the NBA, NCAA, start sending all of our young black men and women to historically black colleges and universities. They can start making billions of dollars 
So, 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 so you said. Let me ask you a question because we're coming up on the break. So if they, if we, if we have a campaign to send um, African American boys to HBCUs and play football there, and 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 tell them don't go to Michigan State or U of M or things like this. Now, now, what, what, how are you saying this will cause the NFL to change their tune? Well, first of all, they'll start paying attention to the black schools and understand. That they take a better understanding, I should say, on what black men and women are going through, and they'll have more concern for our play, if you will. Okay. Like now, I'll bet you, i tell you what, I guarantee you Colin Kaepernick will be back in the league until the season's over with, because mm -hmm. one, the, the only thing white America truly understands is money. Mm -hmm. They're going to let these quarterbacks together. I can't believe they got two club quarterbacks that clean the plant the Cleveland Browns, right. and they're not getting a chance to call it Colin That's Kaepernick. <laughs> this is, this, if somebody's going to get hurt, Right. But never fail. A four hundred two gets hurt every year, and they're gonna say, "We need to get somebody in here who can play right now." Bring Kyle Kaepernick on, and they're gonna do it. Right. Right now, if I'm the owner of a team, especially at Cleveland Browns, I got those scrubs on the field for me. Mm -hmm. Kyle Kaepernick will be there sooner or later. I guarantee. The trend right. in America. <laughs> Don't step on the line. We'll bust you down too, buddy. No. He he's gonna play because the, the, the Almighty Dollar is what rules their mind and rules their rules their life. Okay. So the will be back in, but so we need to send our kids to our schools so they can reap the benefits rather than the so called white institutions throughout the country. Right. Their boy is going to allow that black boy to come play for Alabama stuff. He thought he was because he wanted to do a great, three stuff and great for mm -hmm. black people. He wanted to win. That's why he let that black kid come on his team to play. Who, 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 you, who are you talking about in Alabama? Who are you talking about? Their boys get credit for allowing the first. African American football player to play at an all white institution. Okay. What was his first name? He was the football player called Bear Bryant. Oh, Bear Bryant. Yeah, yeah, Bear Bryant. Okay. Okay, I got you. I got you. Oh, he's such a great guy. He let black guys. He wanted to win. Right. That's right. He saw that those, they couldn't stop that boy. He was too fast, too strong for him. And he wanted to win. And he let those guys play. Because that's what when they went on their trips to uh, play uh, out, of, out, out of state, things like that. Okay. Okay, guy. Well, uh, uh, we're coming up on a break, man. Thanks for calling, okay? Keep Thank listening. You. Keep keep listening. Okay. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Voice of Detroit. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online course that I teach on Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, all the sessions are recorded. If you miss any of it, go back and watch it over and over again. All of my DVD lectures are available at our website also. And if you want to advertise on the African History Network, Network show here on 19 a.m. The Superstation. Email me at info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we're coming up on a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. You don't want to miss this. We'll be back in a few minutes. When you think of the voices of Detroit, there's only one All right, guys. Stand by. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by.